We're talking actors and directors who put on the shows. We're talking playwrights and designers who you'll want to know. From the very first rehearsal to the final curtain call. We, we might, might be off, 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 off Broadway, but we're talking about it all. Because we're two local gals with global pal. It's everything, everything, everything here. With Benita and Ellen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Everything Theater Podcast, the podcast where we talk about everything theater from A to Z. And I'm the Z. Hi, I'm Benita Zahn. And I'm the C. I'm Ellen <laughs> Gibbs. <laughs> and, so what's uh, going on, Ellen? I mean, right now, the Capital Region theater scene is just, it's packed. You, you can't, to get to everything would be impossible, I think. I know. And I'm in rehearsals right now. And I literally, my schedule is down to the every second. It's like, can I squeeze yeah. the show in here? Because there's so much I want to see. I'm going to miss so much. I know. I know. And I just found that I never emailed back to you when you said you weren't going to make it to Agnes of God, which we just closed at uh, Fort Salem Theater. My response to you was, it's all right. I understand. But you know, I'm going to be there for Spring Awakening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And um, this weekend um, on my calendar is to go see the latest production by Harbinger Theater. And I know you've got some info on that for us. Yeah, I will be there too. So um, those of you who listen to our podcast know that we're uh, big fans of Harbinger and they have been very supportive of our podcast and have sponsored this episode. Um, they're coming in, uh, they're going to open their third season with In the Blood by Pulitzer winner Suzanne Laurie Parks. Um, the performances are March 15th through the 24th at St. Rose Theater. Maybe the last time you'll get in there because uh, they're unfortunately closed. But let me give you just a brief insight into In the Blood. It tells the story of Hester, a homeless African-American woman with five children from five different fathers. Hester struggles to survive on the streets while trying to provide for her children. Um, the play shines a light on the harsh realities faced by marginalized individuals in society and raises questions about societal responsibility and compassion. So again, you can, Boy, we can use some compassion, huh? Oh my goodness. Yes, absolutely. So go yeah. check that out. They always do such good stuff. You have till March 24th to catch them. And if you want to, you know, it's light later now, the weather's getting better. It's time to hit the road and just get down to the Catskills. We've got Franklin Trapp with us now as our guest is with, he's the uh, producing artistic director at the uh, Forestburg Playhouse. And so glad to have you with us, Franklin. Thank you so much. It's exciting to be here and to talk everything theater. It's going to be fun. And your history is steeped in uh, Forestburg Playhouse. I mean, the Playhouse has been around since 1947. Clearly, you haven't been around that long. But in the early <laughs> 2000s, that was your stomping ground. Absolutely. Um, one of my first professional jobs was... Uh, uh, to be a member of the resident company uh, of the Forsberg Playhouse, which meant that I was, you know, performing uh, performing at night, rehearsing during the day, doing cabarets, children's theater. Uh, and then ultimately, I, you know, received my equity card when I performed there and started to get directing opportunities as well. So I spent four fabulous summers um, really learning, performing, and and having an amazing experience in the Catskills at the Forsberg Playhouse. It was it was a great way to get out of the city during the summer too. So it was a good gig for me. But then you did something a little out of the norm. You went to law school and practiced at a big firm down in Atlanta. But, you know, the boards called you back when you saw the uh, your predecessor was going to retire. Give us a little bit of that. Well, it's a it's definitely a, a curvy road that I've been walking down. There's no, you know, nothing linear about this path. But, uh, you know, at, at a certain point in my career as an as an actor, um, you know, I realized that I was I, that auditioning and the constant chase was not something that maybe I was built to do, although I loved being a performer, loved directing. Um, and so I did go to law school uh, and had an amazing experience in law school and also practicing as a lawyer. And what I what I like to tell people is is during that time of my life, I think I learned I learned a lot of things that ultimately have served me very very well in taking over the playhouse and 
you know, essentially running it as it's, you know, producing artistic director, which basically means I have a lot of hats, you know. Um, so I've, you know, with with over 250 employees that come and go throughout the summer season uh, and dealing with actors equity with, um, you know, a lot of a lot of different different moving parts, I think, um, as thinking as a lawyer and as an artist has, has been uh, an important combination, I think, uh, in order to you know, keep the playhouse where it is and also keep it growing too. So that's, it, it's been an amazing combination and uh, I'm glad I had the opportunity to come back, back to the Berg, as I like to say. And 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 this is my 11th season. So I, I mean, I've stuck around. So, <laughs> so we're still Thank here. <laughs> that's right. And before we started talking, I said, Franklin, what, so what are we, you're kind of focusing on? You said, all of them right now, <laughs> because you do all seven of your productions in the summer. So tell us what like the calendar year looks like for a company that's structured like yours. Sure. No, I think that's, um, yes. I, and I know that was a little sassy, but it's the absolute <laughs> truth. We are working on, on, on all of it. Um, the, so the playhouse, uh, is, is a seasonal, um, seasonal theater and we begin our season, um, in May, uh, because we're able to open up our, uh, restaurant and and tavern space, which also is a has a cabaret stage and is a you know is is a venue that we can use, and that's the beginning of our season. Then we um, in June, we'll we'll continue you know having events there, and also um, we do an outdoor series of of Broadway concerts where we bring in talent from the city to do what we call Forestburg Under the Stars, and that um, that's uh, that that was born during 2020. Uh, in order to provide safe programming and also, you know, make sure our patrons were were able to enjoy live entertainment in the middle of a of chaos. Uh, and and then we open our main stage season, which is essentially from the you know late late June through Labor Day, where we will present seven main stage musicals and plays, which you know run run the gamut in terms of the shows that we're doing. Uh, and also during that period of time, we uh, we present a, a theater for young audiences production that runs throughout the summer. We have cabarets that that change with each main stage production, uh, an arts education program that uh, operates in the month of July. Uh, and then at the end of the summer, we we flip over into our new works festival, uh, which uh, which is called In the Works in the Woods, where we. Um, we have a week of of development rehearsals and then a weekend of of presentations of new theater, uh, and then after that, it's back to events in the tavern, followed by a month of Rocky Horror uh, at at the Playhouse, uh, which, which is going on its ninth year, and um, and so after that, then it seems like that we would we we have to shut down because it's a it's not a winterized property, um, so all the buildings and all the houses and everything are buttoned up. But then, you know, we immediately jump into announcing the next season um, and working on staffing and casting and fundraising and marketing. And uh, and so that that happens from, you know, November to today while while I'm, uh, you know, hiring, hiring, you know, tons of actors and and also our resident um, technicians and designers and creative teams. And then and also beginning the process of coordinating you know, the preparations for the shows. So it's, uh, it's a year round game. Uh, there's just a few months there where there, there aren't any audiences and there aren't any performances, but there's still plenty of drama, as you know, it's the theater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Franklin, a, a question for you in, in terms of all this, you, you said you were once part of the resident company. Do you have a resident company or do you bring in new talent for each one of your shows? So for the during the summer season, um, we will bring in um, we'll bring in you know a number of equity actors for each production. So four equity actors will be cast in each of our each of our productions. And then for the large the large musicals, the big four as I as I call them this year, uh, our resident company, which is you know sixteen college or recent grads uh, who are in conservatories you know across the country. They come in to perform, um, you know, in ensemble tracks and featured roles. Uh, you know, lots of uh, lots of understudying and covering, but they they are a, a core company for you know the bulk of the summer. Uh, and they also perform in the cabarets and in the TYA production and go through what essentially is 
a theater boot camp of sorts. Um, they they come in wildly talented, uh, but they also grow tremendously throughout the process. So it's a pretty exciting group of people. Um, and and a fun example, which this year it was pretty exciting. Ten of uh, my resident company alums made Broadway debuts. So over the number of years that I've been going, they're they're learning, they're growing, they are they get seasoned in the summer, and it's really exciting to see to see and that kind of artistic growth happen. So it's, say, it's in many ways, that sounds like Williamstown Theater meant to be yeah. and maybe was before they got off track. They did. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, it's and uh, um, and one of the nice it. things is, you know, we're located in, in a in a rural, beautiful part of New York State. But we're also really close to the city. We're 90 miles. So we're able to have access to, to um, you know, to great uh, actors that live in the city and designers and directors. And um, we're also then able to really get out there and and recruit some some exciting talent for the resident company. So it's a big summer you, that's coming up. <laughs> yeah, you, got, you, you start with Forbidden Broadways. Absolutely. Yes. We want to start off with fun. You know, we want to, we want to have, we want to have some good comedy because then we're going to, and make fun of Broadway and do all the spoofing and all that good stuff. Um, because a week later we'll turn around and do a very serious play called How I Learned to Drive, which is, <laughs> um, you know, is challenging subject matter. So we'll, we'll start them off laughing, laughing, and then hopefully, you know, really, really provide some, some intensity. Um, and then we then we get into, you know, a quite quite a variety of shows between, you know, Jimmy Buffett's Escape to Margaritaville, followed by The Prom, followed by Beautiful, the Carol King musical, Rock of Ages, and then taking a left turn and doing Hand to God, which is a fantastic play. So it's a it's a wild wild and wacky summer, but I think it gives a lot of variety and a lot of different types of productions for our audience to enjoy. We've talked a lot with, you know, producing artistic directors and post pandemic, the and just the way you're launching with fun is that audiences are still looking for fun. Is yes, that, you, you're agreeing. I agree wholeheartedly. I think, um, you know, the in 2020, when, um, you know, when many theaters kind of just went went dormant because out of necessity, um, we found that because we had these outdoor concerts, um, that people came needing to be entertained, and um, the laughs were bigger, the the tears were bigger. It was it was pretty exciting. And but I do think that our audiences are still, um, I think everyone is still recovering uh, and figuring out the world. And it's let's 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 be real. It's it it's sort of a toxic toxic world out there to grapple with so i think we do need to make people laugh um or sing along or or just get lost for a couple hours um in the theater i think it's it's the gift we can give give to people um and that's not you know that being said we still do need to provide you know some some challenging or content that will will be will teach or you know educate the audiences of of things they may not be you know, thinking about. So, but laughter is the best medicine right now, I think. I think it is a challenge for companies that want to do and have done in the past edgy work. So um, Ellen is, she's going to be doing, um, uh, hello, but, um, Spring Awakening. Spring Awakening. I'm going to go Rock of Ages. You just said you're um, with a company that I'm intimately involved with a uh, playhouse stage company. And there's, but then in, as we move into the summer, the big show is um, Legally Blonde. And then um, Marvelous One Dress. And One Dress. And the reason I bring that up is I, I, there have been some who've said, oh, so you folks are just looking to fill seats. You're not doing that edgy stuff. But you just spoke, you're not a, you know, you have to program to what speaks to the audience too. And that doesn't mean that if you don't do 
a season of edgy that you're not going to get back to it. And I think sometimes people see black and white and don't always understand it's still about entertaining. And share with us a little bit of your decision making to walk that line. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I mean, wouldn't it wouldn't it be wonderful to have millions and millions of dollars and be able to lose money on every production? Wouldn't that just be grand? Um, but that, you know, for, for us, that certainly is not the case. Um, and uh, I think I think it's very important. Sometimes you just have to put business, you have to put business at the forefront or else you're not going to be able to employ artists. You know, what what we do is is at the end of the day, I mean, somebody said this to me once and it sounded so intelligent that I now that I now parrot it. But, you know, what a theater does is contribute to the artistic economy. And um, and that is uh, an important concept. If we want to be able to to do to, to stay alive, to um, to entertain, but also to employ, um, we have to sell tickets. There's just no other way around it. Um, and I happen to think Spring Awakening is is probably going to do great. It's a beautiful musical. And um, it's, you know, it has such a reputation that, you know, I, I hope for, for you all that you get get all those seats filled. But, you know, at the same time, it's it's important to do the Wonderettes um, and it's important to to do the Legally Blondes. And they're they're also they're they also have value. There's there's all sorts of value in all of these different projects. So it's that's exciting. Tell us a little bit more about your uh, new works program. So how do people get involved with that, and uh, what's the process like? Yeah, the um that's and 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 you know what I this is funny because this relates exactly to what we were just talking about. The beauty of having our new works festival is that we are able to do an entire lineup of of cutting edge, edgy, if that's you know the word we're going to use, or but or but brand new theater. Um, so a few a few years ago, uh, in in well in 2020 actually, when when we all had a little bit extra time on our hands, um, the the playhouse was able to acquire uh, a a church that's right across the street. Um, from the theater. And at that point, uh, we we decided that we now were ready. Uh, to, we had a campus. We have a we had a campus with multiple venues and multiple opportunities to um, to do a festival, which is something I'd been, you know, really wanting to do. Uh, and and then the big question was, is what does this what is this? What is this festival? What is a new works festival? And uh, what we decided to do, uh, which now is called In the Works in the Woods, and it's on its uh, it's on its fourth year, um, we decided that the New Works Festival should should in in a way mirror what the Playhouse does. So we wanted to present a new musical, a new play, um, a new uh, show geared towards younger audiences, so a new TYA production, and then also um, new cabarets. So so the the festival that was the basis of of how we created the festival and um and of course the first year uh turned out so beautifully that we've been rocking and rolling ever since and it keeps growing every year and um you know like like anything we have a submission process where uh you know our committee will review um i think this year we received 180 submissions whereas in you know the first year it was probably like 30 but um so we We'll review all these pieces and then um you know choose what's going to create create a lineup that that works together in terms of providing you know interesting interesting new pieces that are important and also uh will will be will you know to provide a diverse lineup for our um for our festival goers and uh and so it's it's turned into a really exciting um interesting process because it's also grown over the years. Now, one of the things we also do is um, uh, a one person uh, piece, we call it the Solo Sunday, where somebody will be working on or developing their uh, a one person, you know, show slash experience, whatever you want to call it. And so that's started to grow and that's become now a permanent part of the festival. Uh, we also bring in, you know, speakers from different parts of the theater industry to, um, 
to provide, you know, really interesting perspectives. You know, we brought in Charles Bush. We brought in um, uh, Rachel Hoffman, who's a major casting director in the city. Uh, Jesse Green from the New York Times came in. You know, it's it's an interesting way for our audiences to learn about, uh, you know, more than just the onstage situation, but what's what's what the industry is like, what what uh, you know, sort of behind the curtain stuff. So, so that's the festival, and it's the weekend after Labor Day. That's that's what we do every year. So that's uh, growing and and becoming a destination event. That's the that's the goal. And from the capital region, from Albany, it's about two hours to get to you. Mm. Yeah, so pretty much you all hours. are invited if you'd like to attend. So, <laughs> well, Ellen and I, we've got a couple of road trips we want to make this summer. Yeah, uh, right. Definitely. Performances, yeah. But <laughs> so, but it's important, I think, for folks in the capital region to know. You know, everybody immediately thinks, well, summer theater means going over the mountain and going to the Berkshires. But go south, you know, you know, go west, young man, go south, gang, because there is, as you just described, a very rich summer of theater and, you know, places to stay, places to eat. And if you just want to down and back, it's two hours on the throughway, you know, it's not too bad. Yeah, yeah. The and the and the nice thing is is that um well the playhouse is you know getting into its 78th season. So if you think about that, the playhouse survived the rise and fall of the Catskills um, you know, mega hotel, the Borscht Belt era. But the one thing about the Catskills has always been uh, you know, a beating heart of entertainment. And the playhouse has been been a part of that. And the tourism to the Sullivan Catskills, because we're in Sullivan County in the uh, in our Sullivan Catskills, the tourism to the, our neck of the woods has increased so much over the past six years that it is becoming an, a really interesting landscape. Uh, and it also has a lot to offer for people who might want to drive from Albany to to do a, a weekend in the country. You know, it's um, it's it's a lovely, lovely place to be. Uh, and, you know, we're just a part of, you know, a lot of different options of entertainment and, and things to do. We're, we, we're the main professional theater, yeah. but that's... Being you know, that close to the city, does that pose a problem for you getting some of the shows, getting rights to some of the shows? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, it took, it took us uh, until last year to be able to get Jersey Boys because it was playing off Broadway. You know, it, it finished its Broadway run, went on tour... And then, of course, opened off Broadway, and you know, so, it, so sometimes there's there's conflicts because of what's either in the city uh, or what's on a national tour. So, um, you know, we can't do Little Shop of Horrors uh, because it's having a long, long run off Broadway, and um, and that's okay. We'll wait, but it's uh, it's it's you know, you have to follow the cycle of the shows, and when they leave the city tour, close their tours, then we can grab them up. If It's an interesting process for sure. And with your season, I mean, it's it's boom, 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 boom. You know, like you could plan it so that you go catch the tail end of one show and the beginning run of the next because they're so close, which I imagine is such a well-oiled machine that you guys have down by now of switching over shows so quickly. Can you tell us about how you can do that successfully? <laughs> Well, it's uh, basically um, the the energy of the young keep it alive because it is a it's a very um, it's a very you're right it is a well oiled machine it's planned down to the minute um, we we're we're what you would call a traditional two week stock in in that sense every show has a two week rehearsal process um, and then the majority of our shows run for two weeks but we do have one week runs as well so you know it's when, when you open one show, you know, we open our shows on Tuesdays, for example, um, Thursday after that opening, you start rehearsing the next show. So uh, it the beat goes on. You keep, uh, you know, you, you're running a show at night and then having rehearsals and pre-production during the day. Uh, and essentially, when, when we close a show uh, on a Sunday, there is a, you know, changeover, loadout, load-in that happens, you know, Sunday late Sunday afternoon into the evening, and then we're ready for tech on Monday night. 
you know, that's the that's the that's how quick the process goes. So we'll have a, a tech rehearsal Monday night, uh, a final dress on Tuesday afternoon, and then we open up at eight o'clock Tuesday night and it's and it moves. Um, you know, and of course there's days off and daylight days and all of these things built into the process. But but I I tell every single person I interview every single day what happens on that day. And and I say, I'm not going to sugarcoat this, but you're going to be working very, very hard if, when you're going to be here at the playhouse, because that's the only way it could it could happen. How much time? What are you get a two week rehearsal per show or less? Just under two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's fast. It's fast. <laughs> I'm breathless thinking about it. But while also doing another show. <laughs> while running a show at night. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think the thing is, is that we 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 we're very you know transparent with the people we hire we we everybody knows what the schedule is going to be um and we try to hire a resident company because they're really the core of of the performance you know performance side of things that people that can pick up things quick and um and by the end of it they they're experts at they're experts at you know fast rehearsals and covering tracks and all of the things that can keep you, you know, keep you really valuable in the industry. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool to see it happen. I was, as you're talking, I thought this would be fabulous swing training, right? I mean, like we talked about on the podcast before how we don't know how yeah. anyone does any swing work, but if you're doing a summer like this, like th that would hone those skills. It, it really does. I mean, and I, and they all, they all leave at the end of the um, summer and, and become so useful, you know, out in the out in the industry or or back at school, they get bored because they're rehearsing a show for two months. Um, you know, they're ready to learn. They're ready to learn more and more quickly. But um, it's first it's they get amazing. a week at a spa, though, right? They everybody leaves and goes to the spa for one week. <laughs> Some sometimes they leave and go right back to school, you know, and literally start classes the next day. But um, they should they should go to a spa. <laughs> <laughs> they really should. I need to too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to get you as an underwriter. Is there anything that you that's been on your key? I wish we could program, but you haven't been able to get it list for a season or two or four. Um, you know that's a good that's a very good question. Um, I know I'm I'm a little bitter about Little Shop of Horrors, but that's that's just one in particular. Uh, cause I think it's a fun, quirky show, but, uh, at the moment, you know, it's such, it's been such a cycle over the past 10 years of shows that we've wanted to do. And then we've waited and gotten to do them. So I, right now I'm feeling pretty content, but give me a, give, give me a couple months and then I'll be, I'll start to see where, where we are with thinking what the next year is going to be, but, um, we'll play again, Franklin. we will. Yeah. But Ellen's got a series of very special questions for you now. Yes, we've reached Great. that time of the episode at the end. We like to do a uh, a little lightning round called the close-up. Yes. Um, she's just some questions about you, Franklin. So are you ready okay. for your close-up? I am ready for my close-up. So when was the moment in your life when you just knew, I have to do theater? That moment happened. Um, I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, I saw the national tour of Rent. And, and I just, I just, just was obsessed with the show. And they happened to have auditions in Atlanta at the same time that they were running the show. And I went to the, I went to this audition, and I was called back five times for, for the show. And, um, and I and I don't know if it was because my ego was stroked or something, but I was I, I thought to myself, this is something that I could do, you know, whether I get this or not, this is something I could do and that I have to try. And so I I moved to New York a year later and and was in and and had had a very modest but nice career as a performer and um everything I did I enjoyed. And so it was I, I'm very glad I did it. Is there a show in your life that just has a very special meaning to you, whether like something that you saw or read or performed in or worked on? I, you know, that it's, it's so funny. That's an easy question, actually. Um, I absolutely love the musical Ragtime. Um, and I, and I don't know if you've seen or listened to that 
marvelous score, but I I would I've had the the joy of being a part of of that show, and I think what I loved so much about it was how important it was and how how it well now it still is. I mean, it's even more important. I think. Um, so I think that was a really profound experience with a, an amazing cast. Every so often you get that that group of people that are all on the same page and in a magical place and doing something important. And I think that's that's ragtime to me. That that's one of my faves. Uh, here's a silly one. Uh, is there any big um, theater blooper that you have uh, faced either yourself or seen? Oh, oh I mean, I think. Um, Get, because our process is so fast, opening night will often have uh, have some bloopers. Um, I think my my biggest blooper was um, I was in the I was performing in the national tour of Annie, and um, there is a a scene where it's Christmas and uh, and you know Annie's excited all the all the way you know the butlers are running around and and getting presents ready, and my job was to ride a tricycle across the stage and sing sing while I did that. Well, let's just say we were playing Boston. I pushed off. I had a I had some good momentum and then the wheel on the tricycle gave out and I went flying over it and landed at zero in front of 4000 people. So that was uh that was a good blooper, but you know what you do, you just carry on and 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 smile and run run as fast as you can to get to your spot. So. You say ta-da, right? Ta-da, shapoopy. What would be your advice to someone who wants to work at, at somewhere like uh, your structure where it is just so fast, 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 fast? I mean, I think um, I would I would say that, you know, you, I, but I would say this for any anybody that goes into any process is that you know the 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 hard work and the preparation um are are critical uh you should always you should always get yourself as ready as possible so that when you're in the room and you're rehearsing you can play you can explore and so if it is a fast process it means you have to do you have to do work on the front end in order to be able to to do great work in the in the moment and in the room i think that's that's what I would tell people. Um, I would also say that, uh, you know, it's a marathon, not a race. And, you know, to to pace yourself and and take care of yourself and let us take care of you. But, uh, yeah, I think preparation is just it's so key. It's so key for for everything. This is a profession. So be a professional. Be prepared. That's great advice. That really is. This has yeah. been a pleasure, Franklin. I'm so glad we're able to work this out to be able to chat with you. What an exciting- Well, thank you. I so appreciate the opportunity to talk everything theater with you all. This has been fun. <laughs> and one more time, Ellen, before we uh, call it a night and we'll, you know. Yeah, so make sure that you check out In the Blood. Um, it uh, opens this week on the 15th at St. Rose Theater. It's a Harbinger Theater production. Um, they always do a, such amazing work, and you have until the 24th to catch it, so don't miss it. It's the beginning of their third season. And take a look at the Forestburg Playhouse. Get them on your calendar this summer. It sounds like a treat every weekend, every even midweek, so get on down there. Frank <laughs> Thank you so much. All best. Thank you. This has been fun. And for our listeners, we'll catch you next time. I'm Ellen Cribs. And I'm Benita Zahn. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to the Everything Theater Podcast. Special thanks goes out to Alice Grinling for our photography and Justin Friello for composing our amazing theme song. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you want to share your thoughts or what's going on in your theater community, you can reach out to us on social media or through our email at everythingtheaterpodcast at gmail.com. Till next time. It's everything, everything, everything. everything.